five years ago, I realized that we have a problem in, in the United States. And I was trying to come up with a solution. I was, I was thinking about it all the time. And I realized what we needed was, was bourbon. So I spent a lot of time in the hills of Kentucky, walking around, petting the animals, naming the streams, writing songs. And as I was walking through the hills, I, I made a discovery. While I, I was thinking about bourbon, I, I found it. It was wild turkey. Up on the hill, there was this distillery there that nobody had ever seen before. I mean, it was, it was a really spiritual experience for me. I, we were looking for bourbon and n nobody in the entire world knew that this bourbon was here until me, Matthew McConaughey, I found it. And I'm excited to share it with you. Nation, in all seriousness, we're just, we're talking about some wild turkey products today. What, what many whiskey believe, what many whiskey geeks believe to be the last best hope for value bourbon on the shelves today? Is it the last best hope? No, I mean, that's probably uh, kind of doom and gloom talk. Anytime anybody tells you anything is the last best hope for anything, they're probably wrong. They've probably overblown the significance of something. Regardless, I do think wild turkey is uh, probably the new old best value in bourbon. Before wild turkey, I would have said Heaven Hill because, I mean... Heaven Hill has some great stuff at reasonable price points. Elijah Craig, I would have said Henry McKenna before it kind of blew up. Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, we all know that. A decent wheat whiskey and larceny at a very accessible price point. I mean, Heaven Hill was kind of my, my jam. And still is my jam. But is it the best value in bourbon? Ugh, I don't know. As an as a overall distillery, that may have shifted over to Wild Turkey. I'll let you be the judge as we assess really two products, the two core products of the Wild Turkey brand that bourbon geeks are just, we're all about it. And we're all about it because it's such a good value for the price you pay. And those two products, two, would be Wild Turkey 101 Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey or Wild Turkey Rare Breed, which is the barrel proof version of this. First, let's do a little review of Wild Turkey 101. We'll get to tasting it in a little bit. We'll taste them side by side, but a brand review of Wild Turkey 101. This uh, brand, 101, started in 1942. That was two years after Austin Nichols Company started bottling under the Wild Turkey name. Now, the, we'll cover the Wild Turkey name in another video at some point, but the 101 release has now, therefore, been around for a long time. Now, Austin Nichols is important to understand. They weren't distilling. You'll actually see the words Austin Nichols um, around the wild turkey in older bottlings of wild turkey, but they were not distillers for a long time. They were sourcing their whiskey, but they owned the wild turkey brand. Now, from 1942 up until like 1971-ish, they were sourcing from what we know now as the wild turkey distillery, but again, they didn't own it. So what was going into a bottle of this is probably a product of several distilleries or you know it may have gone back and forth from coming from what was previously called the old rippy distillery or the boulevard distillery could have come from there or it could have come from other distilleries austin nichols purchased it bottled it sold it so this was a sourced whiskey for the first almost 30 years of its existence then we get into 1971 when austin nichols acquires the old Rippy slash Boulevard slash JTS Brown Distillery, all the same place. They acquire it um, and then start to run the production of wild turkey themselves through this distillery. This distillery was housed in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. So just down the road from Buffalo Trace, not far at all. Uh, not far at all from Four Roses. If you're going to go to Kentucky and see distilleries, you're either going to go to Louisville and see all the touristy crap, you're going to go to Bardstown and see Heaven Hill. You're going to see Willett, 1792 Barton, uh, Bardstown Bourbon Company. Um, 
you were going to drive past Jim Beam on the way there, or you're going to go to Frankfurt, Lawrenceburg, and you're going to see Buffalo Trace, Four Roses, and Wild Turkey. So it's in one of the bourbon meccas of Kentucky. I think there's only one technical mecca, though. Eventually, Austin Nichols sold Wild Turkey, and it went, I think, first to Pernod Ricard. Then it went over to Campari, uh, where, where it lives today. Now, the distillery, of course, has stayed there, but in 2011, that old Rippy distillery, like, they, they moved from that facility and built the new Wild Turkey distillery, as we know it. Um, that helps them maintain a much larger um, production cycle than what they had previously in the smaller Old Rippy Boulevard JTS Brown distillery. So this has always been sort of the core product for the Wild Turkey brand. Uh, it is 101 proof, which makes sense because there's a big 101 on there. And it, it used to be eight years old. It was an age-stated whiskey. There have been a couple different releases. Of course, there's a 12-year 101 cheesy gold foil, but the standard 101 was an eight-year release until it wasn't. Now it's probably a blend, they say, of, you know, six to eight-year-old whiskey, which, it, I mean, they kind of taste like that. It doesn't have the depth of the old eight-year, um, which I was fortunate enough to try recently, and you can go check that out on our podcast, entryproofpodcast.com. Um, lots of great content on there as we build that up, but there was the Drew Tastes Dusties episode where I tried eight-year-old Wild Turkey 101, and man, that was really, really solid. Wild Turkey 101, still solid. Is it the same? No, unfortunately, it's not. But this is a 75% corn, so pretty high corn, 13% rye, 12% barley. So low rye, no. High rye, no. It's sort of a middle-of-the-road rye bourbon. That said, it's pretty spicy. Like for a, a 13% rye, I, I would expect less funky, nutty, rye-centric spice uh, than is what than what is in here. You may be asking why I got this tiny little dinky hip flask that looks like I, you know, I'm smuggling it in, into prom. It's because I didn't want to buy a whole bottle. I got a lot of whiskey and I this isn't my favorite. It's not really my profile, so I didn't want to buy a whole one. But thankfully, liquor store nearby had one of these. Now, fun fact, as we assess sort of the history of Wild Turkey as a brand and this product, is yes, the the taste profile has evolved over the years. I mentioned it went from an eight year to a non-age stated. They changed production facilities in 2011, whole new distillery. Another thing is that Wild Turkey Distillery, or the distilling for Wild Turkey, was done at one of the lowest entry proofs in the business. They ran at 107 proof, which is super low, like low, like lower than Little John or whoever did that rap song, the Get Low one, <laughs> lower than that. Um, 107 proof is really low. They ran that until 2004, and then they moved to 110 proof, and then they moved to 115 proof in 2006. And remember, the entry proof is the proof the the white dog the new make spirit goes into the barrel at so it's probably coming off the still around 140 you add water it goes into the barrel and conventional wisdom which i don't know if it's true or not has told us that a lower entry proof makes better bourbon maybe i mean i tend to like uh you know barrel proofs that come out in the 110 115 proof range that you know don't have to be diluted to live in that very palatable range four roses runs a slightly lower barrel or entry proof than heaven hill or buffalo trace theirs is 125 um, and wild turkey does the same and i tend to like the wild turkey higher proof stuff like rare breed because it's not blow your face off hot but that said, that the change in entry proof from 107 to 110 to 115, from original to, you know, up until 2006 and running at the 115 proof today, that's just bound to have an impact on the juice. Whether positive or negative, it's going to, you know, we're going to see some variation in the, in the product. Now, the price tag on a full bottle, a 750 mil of Wild Turkey 101, is like $22. Or you can get a handle of it, you know, 1.75. For 30 or 35, it's ridiculous. Like the price for this is ridiculous. And we're talking about 101 proof, so good proof point, 
six to eight year old bourbon. So we're starting to knock on the door of why is this such a great value for bourbon geeks? Well, it's because you can spend $100 to $150 on a four year craft whiskey or a sourced whiskey from MGP, or you can get Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, six to eight years old, 101 proof for nothing. And it's pretty good. I mean, I don't know what else I need to say. Case closed, class dismissed. <clears throat> So hold that thought on the 101, and let's talk about rare breed for a while. This is the same stuff, same mash bill, 75% corn, 13% rye, 12% barley, um, but it's barrel proof. Now they create rare breed in these big batches, so they create a big batch of rare breed that lasts for a while, so the proof point doesn't change for sometimes five years. Now it's cycling at a slightly higher rate. The one I have is 116.8 proof, which, you know, barrel proof at 116.8, I like that. I'm not a big fan of the 130 to 140 proof because it's just so intense. Your palate doesn't really let you perceive what all is going on in the whiskey when you're talking about that high a proof point, that much alcohol up in your grill. This particular product, this barrel proof wild turkey, came out in 1991 and was really the response to the late 80s release from Jim Beam called Booker's. So we all know Booker's, it's this guy over here. It is barrel proof, uncut, unfiltered Jim Beam. And that was released under the supervision of Booker No, the previous master distiller to the current Beam master distiller, Fred No. Booker, um, apparently, the story goes, Booker was giving Bookers as gifts and then eventually turned it into a premium product line for Jim Beam. That was met, that was, it was successful. It was met with um, thumbs up. And so Jimmy, Jimmy Russell, Jimmy, Jimmy Russell, over at Wild Turkey, like, oh, I guess I gotta do something like that now. And so, Rare Breed. And Rare Breed, I mean, while it hasn't been met with the, the lust, the clamor of Booker's, particularly as we've gone through the bourbon boom of the 2000 teens and into the 2020s now, I'd say it's just as good. Like, I think that if Rare Breed was produced in smaller batches and released on an allocated level, it would go bananas. Like, you wouldn't be able to find it on the shelf. That said, you can still find it on the shelf and you can find it on the shelf for 40 to $50. Whereas Booker's used to be $50 when I got into the game in 2016. And now it's like $90. So the fact that this is still very reasonable, I mean, I spent $40 for this bottle. Um, yeah, again, you're starting to see like, oh, wow, there's some value there. And this one actually may be even older than Booker's. Booker's has not you know, crept above the, seven and a half year mark in their releases in quite some time, whereas Rare Breed is supposed to be a blend of six to 12 year old whiskeys. So you're probably getting a little bit more age out of the Rare Breed. Well, you're definitely getting more age out of the Rare Breed compared to the Wild Turkey 101, but you're probably also beating the age of Booker's. And I think it makes a great substitute for Booker's. While it's not maybe as hot as and intense, I think it's sweeter, it's oakier, um, and the profiles are more or less comparable. We'll get to that in a little bit. At the end of this video, stay tuned because I'm gonna taste these two side by side and then I'm gonna take Rare Breed up against Booker's and Elijah Craig 12. It's probably biggest semi-available competitors in the barrel proof market from large distilleries. So just the specs on these Kentucky Straight Bourbon whiskeys kind of shows that, oh yeah, that there's, there is still value to be had here. And again, for some reason, they're still widely available on the shelf, like good on wild turkey. Like it, it's good for us as consumers to be able to have products like this available to us, to in, be able to enjoy really premium bourbons for non-premium prices when all other bourbon seems to be escalating dramatically in, in price point. That's not happening with wild turkey. So if you are a fan of the good old days, um, wild turkey is a good old days brand. Now I'm gonna be transparent. I, you know, I'm gonna taste this guy up against Elijah Craig 12 and Booker's, but Wild Turkey has not been like my profile. When I think about what I love in, in bourbon, uh, Wild Turkey has this nuttiness and this kind of sourdough tang, not tang like 
you know, orange zest, not tang like cranberries, but like a sourdough bread, a tangy sourdough bread. There's this like peanuts, sourdough bread, um, and then rice spice, and then you get sweeter notes as well, which we'll pick up in the tasting in a minute, but that sourdough bread tang uh, is, is not a, a note that I, I find particularly uh, appealing, and it's really evident in the Wild Turkey 101. It kind of gets, it, it fades out as, as Wild Turkey products get a little bit older. But if you do like that note, which many people do, they call it the Wild Turkey Funk, then I don't really know why you would buy anything else. Unless you just like adventuring and tasting different stuff. If you just like to have a stable bourbon, good price point, I mean, this is really all you need. And my brother, my younger brother, actually, I'm pretty sure this is all he buys. <laughs> now let's taste some whiskey. If you're looking at the clock behind me, yes, it, it is 11.40. Um, I'm on paternity leave, so this is okay. I'm not going to drink that much right now. Shoot. The, the nose on the Wild Turkey 101 is light. It reminds me kind of a dank uh, Rick House. There's that classic, sweet, spicy bourbon, like angel share kind of nose, which uh, is, I mean, it, it, it sings to my soul a little bit, plucks on my heartstrings. There's a very earthy quality to moss and cedar. And then it tastes like a high rye bourbon, that sourdough tang. A little bit of a, like a tree bark retro nasal, like if you're walking in the woods, this sort of like dank wood, not in a good way, but not in a terrible way either. Kind of works. Like this feels like an old school bourbon. You know, it tastes like something your grandpa would have drunk. Maybe you get slight suggestions of apple and, and citrus, but it really lives in the spicy, nutty family of bourbon versus fruity. It's not, not a very fruity product at all. The sweetness of 101 is more in the vanilla honey family, less of the molasses brown sugar, and I think that's just due to the age. You know, it's supposed to be six to eight years old. It doesn't taste very old. You know, it's very light on the palate, even at 101 proof. We ship gears over here, and on the nose immediately, you get a lot more sweet oak out of the rare breed. Like, it's very apparent straight away. It doesn't smell that much hotter. I mean, we're talking about 15 proof points, so the difference between 101 and barrel proof is 7%-ish alcohol by volume. Not a huge difference there. But I like that. I like that it's not crazy hot on the nose, because I feel like I need sit and search for a while. I still get cedar. It's almost like smoked cedar at this point though. It's cedar on fire with some deep oaky molassesy, still rye heavy, like very spicy, clovish kind of profile on this guy. And then the, the light sweetness of this has definitely taken a step much deeper. I get plenty of barrel char on the palate, but it's not overpowering, it's not over-oaked. And then it kind of flashes back and forth between these brown sugar, uh, caramel, like vanilla custard, and then this heavy, heavy spice. Which again makes me think that this is a much higher rye whiskey than it is, but whatever. Something about the way they make it makes it pretty, uh, pretty nutty and spicy. It's like peanuts and saltwater taffy, some caraway. It's a really, really solid bourbon. When I opened this bottle the other night, I was like, I'm gonna just sit with this for a while before I do the video. I'm like, man, I actually, while Wild Turkey profile is not like my absolute favorite, I should go back to it more because Rare Breed is phenomenal at $40. Like I would be happy drinking this for the rest of my life if it's all I had. I'm glad it's not all I have, but Man, you know, it's one of those things where you're kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like if Henry McKenna blew up, and that's hard to find. E.H. Taylor Small Batch, like these whiskeys that are fine, like they're good. But then something like this sits on the shelf for less money. Yeah, it feels like the clock is maybe ticking. All right, so let's run Rare Breed up against some compatriots here. 
Booker's, and Elijah Craig. Am I doing this blind? No. No, I'm not. Um, does that influence the tasting? Sure it does, but that said, I think I can still, still probably make a call. Hopefully this doesn't get in the way too much. All right, so I'm gonna hit Rare Breed one more time. Yeah, so the saltwater taffy creamy mouthfeel is very satisfying, particularly when it comes with the age. One of the other things about wild turkey that may be helpful is that number four char, like very charred barrels that kind of accelerate the aging process. You see that out of Old Forester as well. Now Booker's. Less depth on the nose. Like I don't get deep sweetness or pronounced char on the nostrils on the Booker's. The palate's very comparable in the funky nuttiness, in the sourdough tang. Like these two products feel like they could come from the same distillery. Less aged beam against mid-range aged wild turkey. Very, very comparable in their nutty rye forward profiles. Now, out of these two, I'm gonna take the rare breed because it delivers depth and sweetness in the brown sugar, maple syrup, molasses kind of range, whereas the Booker's brings all kind of funky rye forward flavor. There's no shortage of flavor and lighter sweetness in the Booker's. It's not packing the, it's not packing the layers of different kind of flavors that the rare breed has. Let's do Elijah Craig. This is way more in the sweet end of the spectrum. Buttercream frosting. So the, the sweetness changes from this more like funky, nutty peanut molasses to a, oh, this is refined. This is powdered sugar. This is butter and, you know, buttercream frosting. The rye is really toned down. It's not very spicy on the nose. Maybe baking spices, but not more herbaceous. And then the palate is mostly dessert. Maybe some roasted nuts in there. Less funky, more like sweet. Honey roasted, uh, honey roasted cashews, something like that. With plenty of barrel influence. Again, this is 12 years. So we got six to 12 six, almost seven, and 12. This definitely shows the, the mellowing influence of barrel time. I mean, the proof on this is 130. So we're talking about a 15 proof point difference between these two, you wouldn't know it. You kind of feel it here. The Booker's is a little bit hotter, a little more punchy than the rare breed. Elijah Craig, even though it's a heavy hitter, that extra barrel time has helped maybe soften the edges, bring more sweetness. Elijah Craig barrel proof is an exceptional whiskey. I, I, this truly is my, if I only had to drink one whiskey, or if I could only drink one whiskey for the rest of my life, it would be this one. That said, I'd be happy with this one. It's a little more off profile for me, but it's still very, very good. And given the fact that this is $40 compared to, I mean, you're lucky to find this at 60 now, more likely you're gonna find it at 75, 80, 90 right now, which I think is still a great value for Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. That for 40 to 50, my goodness. It makes you think twice about reaching for this bottle. It makes you think three times about reaching for this bottle. Nation, that's gonna do it. That's my overview of Wild Turkey 101, Wild Turkey Rare Breed, the oldest, newest, best value in bourbon. Maybe, maybe the last best chance for a sustained value product in the American whiskey category. Hope you dug. If you like this video, please get down and smash the thumbs up button. I would appreciate that. Leave a comment. Do you agree? Do you not agree? Is there a better value than this? You let me know. If you want more content, subscribe to the channel. Go to entryproofpodcast.com. That is where you can check out our podcast, my podcast with Brian Vikey over at Abandoned Bourbon. You can follow me on Instagram at Droopy Whiskey. And if you want to support the channel or podcast, go to patreon.com slash entryproofpodcast. You can earn some extra bonus content or some dope swag over there. Maybe some barrel picks too. Now stay healthy and stay safe. Remember y'all, keep it neat. Bye.